This is the I Read Comic Books podcast, the very best podcast for regular comic book fans. I'm your host, Mike Rappin, and joining me this week, two different manga apps vying for my attention despite the piles and piles of comics I have sitting next to me right now. This week, I'm joined by Kara Shimborski. Wait, am I Viz or Shonen Jump? I, listen, I'll let you pick. I'll let you pick. <laughs> And this week, we have a very special guest, guest comic book creator, uh, live with a brand new Kickstarter, Bijan Aga. Hello. Thank you both for joining me this week. Very excited to talk about comic books, if only because this is going to be the last episode that I'm going to be on the show until August. Um, if only, or I guess, live recording. You're going to hear my voice as a listener on future episodes that we have pre-planned for our break that we have in July. But like, just because of scheduling and, and weird flight patterns that I have to take for the next couple of weeks, I'm basically done in June. And then I'm not going to really be on the show in July for a couple of episodes. So it's going to be bonkers for me to have so much time not on this podcast but still be very busy um but today we are not here to talk about my summer plans we're here to talk about comic books <laughs> and more importantly we're here to talk to our very special guest uh Bijan. uh i guess before we jump into things because i'm going to kick right over to you to ask you my two legally mandated questions which is how have you been how have comic books been but could you tell the folks a little bit about yourself um and before you jump in and tell us what you've been reading uh yeah sure so uh, my name is Bijan. I'm from Seattle, Washington, and I've been living in South America for a while. And I love classic comic books. So one of the many projects that I'm working on, I, I work in all different kinds of mediums, but one is comic books. And I w wanted to make a comic book that has was inspired by the golden age storytelling, golden age art, and had more modern politics. So as a queer and Muslim creator, I wanted to create a queer and Muslim superhero. Uh, so I'm having a Kickstarter for that. And we can talk more about that later. Heck yeah. Heck yeah. Yeah. Yes. And I, you know, I read the first issue of this. It's it's really, really fun. But Kara, go ahead. Oh, no. I was going to say, I also read the first issue of this. Is that what you sent me? Is that what I read? Yes, yes, yes. This is Cobra it's good. Lipis. It's, yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly. Which is why we're so glad to have Bijan back. Um, so, but I guess let's just dive into things. I mean, how, other than, you know, working on this Kickstarter that I think literally just launched, um, how have you been? How have comic books been? What have you been reading? So, yeah. So, I, one of the things that I've been really fascinated with recently is the shift from the Golden Age to the Silver Age. Okay. And, one of the reasons that I've been so interested in that is because, you know, I'm going through a bunch of transitional stuff in my own life. I'm trying to transition into doing art full time and I'm, you know, and going through a physical transition as well um, into uh, someone with a, an estrogen based system. So um, I really am interested in the idea of how we evolve as our morality evolves and our understanding of ourselves evolves. So the Golden Age was really inspirational for me for especially the first issue of Cobra Olympus because there was this fresh, untamed newness to everything. The idea that you could show, you know, it was almost it was almost cinematic, but it was all, also literary in that there was no limitations on what you could show. You didn't need an actor. You didn't need a stage. You didn't need special effects. If you wanted to show something science fiction, you could draw whatever you wanted on the page. So the Golden Age is just this unbridled passion, unbridled creativity. And then the Silver Age, we start transitioning into a stronger understanding of what people like about comics, not just what people wanted to write, but what people wanted to read. Because now comic book readers were growing up and they were starting to create comics of their own. And so um, I've really been getting into uh, the original group of comics called the Justice League. And um, it's uh, the writer is Gardner Fox. Uh, the pen penciler is Mike Sikowski. And um, it's really interesting because only now in the digital age do I have the opportunity to have a collection of the original Justice League stories because they weren't originally printed as a single title that you could just buy issue one, two, three, four of Justice League. They were printed as occasional stories here and there in The Brave and the Bold. The mm. Brave and the Bold being anything they felt like writing at the time that they thought <laughs> would sell. Um, so it's very interesting to, because it's, because, uh, you know, we, there's a lot of complex things going on with the app comiXology and the, the company that owns it, but the raw nature of being able to have digital comics in higher fidelity than even when they were first printed, you know, much closer to the original intent of the, the inkers and the pencilers, 
and you know with really clear colors really beautiful rich colors that you weren't able to get in the printed page back in the day i think that uh um and that's one of the reasons why we're in on the cobra olympus um kickstarter we're we're doing a digital edition is because we really feel like the ability for computers now to create these very rich beautiful color images has completely changed our relationship with comics mm -hmm. because we're, we're it's it's you know it's like the upgrade to hd in the house you know that's why everyone's streaming in the house is because our tvs look incredible compared to the way they used to right mm -hmm. right so I, I really and and again the ability to collect on theme you know i can have i can go out and i can just you know checklist down the list of which comics i want to get and i can get just the justice league ones because honestly a lot of the brave and the bold is, is not interesting to a modern reader so uh, the, one of the things i really like about it is that it shows an evolution specifically from bill everett's work and i feel that way a lot of the way because of the way they uh that um uh mike skitkowski draws uh human bodies and I, I've always said this about uh, Bill Everett. Bill Everett had a way of drawing human bodies where even when they were supposed to be superhuman beings having superhuman struggles, he would draw flesh in a way that was consistently vulnerable. You always felt like someone could really get injured with all the action that was going on. Mm. So it wasn't these sort of like super hard bodies just smashing each other into each other like titanium walls. Sure. It was... The idea of, of two combatants who eat any one of them could get the upper hand on the other at any time. And, and you know, uh, Human Torch versus Namor was the first crossover comic as we understand them to be today. Right. Uh, up, up until that point, um, there was it just uh, there was just no, no idea that these comic book characters shared the same world. And the idea of the Justice League is sort of the, the complete... You know, that taking it to the logical extension, the most logical extreme, which is not only do some comic book characters take place in the same world, but actually all of our comic book characters take place in the same world. Mm -hmm. So. Um, so, you know, it's 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 really interesting that both the art style and the storytelling style share DNA with Bill Everett's work. Um, and uh, and so I'm not I'm not very far into it. I'm just a couple of, of issues in. Mm -hmm. But I've noticed uh, three things that I really wanted to share. Sure. Uh, pretty funny things. One, the stories are really centered around the le least popular characters. And I really think the, the idea is that they were trying to push characters like Wonder Woman and Martian Manhunter and Green Lantern to readers who were more accustomed to skipping those books. Mm -hmm. And. So Superman and Batman always have some extremely specific excuse why they cannot <laughs> join them Classic. for like the world is ending and like and like Bruce Wayne is like, no, I have a party tonight. Sorry. You know, I'm, man, I'm bring out. back party boy Wayne. Where did that go? <laughs> Such a great excuse. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and and then the other thing is that they tried to have a self insert character, and I'm I'm thinking that they that they were trying to do more of a Robin, but it came off more as um, the Blue Ranger from Turbo and Power Rangers, okay. where there's just a little kid and no one no one likes him and everyone thinks he's annoying. <laughs> oh God! And eat this. This character, he's like a, he's like you know a, a young adolescent, and his name is Snapper Carr, Perfect. and his thing is that he's always snapping. No, and, wait a minute. And so <laughs> this is like, and not only is it a super unreal, like I've never met anyone who for whom that was true. I've never met anyone who was just snapping all the time. <laughs> Hey, what's going on? Like every frame he's in, he's snapping, and to the point where his name—they no, I don't. No one remembers his real first name. Everyone just calls him Snapper because all he does is snap, Amazing. and that's his Wait. character trait. <laughs> no, Snapper Carr was definitely a character in the Bruce Timm verse animated Justice League. I had to Google this. Apparently, his first name is Lucas, and you're right. He's originally <laughs> from this series that you're reading, but then, like, I guess people just kept him around because they're like. DC loves being self-referential. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> but he he is the worst. Every time he shows up, the story grinds to a halt. Mm -hmm. Like 
he's just it's just oh and and everyone is so enamored with him like it's he's basically like like they were trying to it's a it's almost like a mary sue except instead of the authors inserting themselves it's them trying to insert the audience being like look at how cool you are you could be a member of the justice oh, League man. just oh, no, by that's... being slick and fast like snapper car that's my favorite part about comics like this though this is like like I, I read a lot of, I, I grew up reading a lot of Archie comics and the older I got, the more I realized, oh, these are adults writing stories about teenagers for children. <laughs> and that's why <laughs> everything is so distorted. And it feels like a similar vibe where it's like, ah, these are adults writing a story about gods, except <laughs> one of them is a child, but none of these people are parents. <laughs> <laughs> oh man I, i'm getting a t-shirt with snapper car on it i think i think this, <laughs> this is the best character i've ever heard of <laughs> oh yeah, my and, gosh I, yeah it's it's uh and 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 so there's like there's huge issues of the story that have nothing to do with snapper car he'll like show up and be like hey what's going on and they'll like explain it to him and then he'll be like okay cool then he'll just you know piss off but there are also issues that totally center around him and are all about him. And they're the worst one. Amazing. <laughs> That's. Oh. But like, what are, what does he do? Is the plot like he snaps and like, he's accidentally wearing no. the Thanos gauntlet and is the infinity <laughs> gauntlet in the world ends. Like what are, what are his plots that they need to save him from? Okay. So if I remember correctly, there's, uh, it's a lot of things just happening to him. Like okay. one where he like he likes something is forcing him to change age over and over again. And so he's like a baby and then he's an old man and he has to keep convincing the Justice League that it's still him by being snappy. Stop. That's so bad. I love it. <laughs> Amazing. And then uh, and then the last thing I wanted to notice is that um, they jumped the shark immediately. Like the comic book ne could never get better than its first issue, which is Starro the Conqueror. Oh, yeah. And Starro the Conqueror is such an amazing villain and just pure sci-fi nonsense. I love it. Just a giant starfish mm. that like eats people. I, I love it. It's so weird. And I'm and I just I, I you know, I'm I'm really enjoying the comic. I'm really having a lot of fun with it. But it, it they set the bar way too high on issue one. where They hit it out of the park. <laughs> I mean, it, they're, like, still, it, they're still using Starro today. That was the yeah. villain in Suicide Squad. Yeah. Oh yeah, Starro rules. I love Starro. <laughs> well, that's so it, this is so this collection that you're reading, this is like a, a big omnibus that you're you're paging through? Yeah, exactly. So yeah, okay. it's uh I'm um I think it's part of the classics line. Okay. Um yeah, I, I it's the same way I read uh the uh original Molten Run on Wonder Woman. Um Nice. So mm -hmm. yeah, so it it's it again, that's one of the things that I really love about digital comics is that we can now um buy them in in groups you know that are relevant to our interests instead of just how they came out came out right totally isn't that original wonder woman run just so fascinating oh <laughs> i oh i i someday i'm gonna write a book all about it like i <laughs> like my relationship to that to that comic is is deep and profound mm -hmm. that's amazing uh well uh kara let me let me kick it over to you um and let me ask how have you been how have comic books been what have you been reading Oh my god. Okay, so first of all, Mike, I've only seen like two episodes of Broad City, but there's this okay. like one gif, I think it's like Ilana Glazer just being like, how am I with like the quotes, and I've never actually <laughs> heard her say the line, but just like the way her she's like physically acting in this gif with like these gifs. I'm fine. Okay. <laughs> I'm fine. No, like, <laughs> no, I'm just like, I've been having trouble sleeping the last couple nights, so mm. I'm coming into this show a little punchy. Sure, sure, <laughs> like, sure. That was me last week. I totally get it. It's, it's that time yeah. of year, I guess. Totally. It's like we're we're not in school anymore, but we're just like, oh, man, it's summer. I'm so mm -hmm. close to the end. But <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. the end never comes when you're a grown up. But anyways, no, I'm good. I uh, this week recorded a uh, very special episode of the show with Tia all about elf quest. So yes. I'm really excited for that to to come out later. Spoilers if you're on our Patreon, that's happening at yeah. some point. But uh it'll be it'll be out in July on the public feed, I think. So Oh, on the public feed, peeled. not just yeah. Patreon? Mm -hmm. <gasps> fancy. We're mm -hmm. so fancy. All right. Uh well, that was super fun. And so that was a comic that I read that I won't 
say anything about because I want you to tune into the show. And also, it is 750 pages of volume one, and we do not have the time <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. On, on this episode. I saw the um, recording links for that episode. It was uh, It's great. I'm very excited. <laughs> it's, it's robust. Um, so I read something uh, much, much shorter. I read Black Widow Volume 1, The Ties That Bind. This is a book that I bought, I think, when it first came out. 2020 publication. It's Kelly Thompson, Aleda Sagrande, and Jordi Belair. And this, I'm pretty sure this is like somebody else on this show said, you have to read this. And I said, okay, and bought it and then didn't <laughs> touch it for three years. So uh, finally read it. Kind of glad that I waited because I feel like it's such a psychologically dense book for something that's really short that mm -hmm. I think reading this in early pandemic just it wouldn't have registered or it would have been like possibly too traumatic sure because what happens in this story in a way where I'm attempting to not give away spoilers is uh Black Widow is brainwashed and into like living the perfect life like she doesn't remember that she's a superhero she has a hot rich fiance because they're living like driving distance from san francisco in a mansion mm -hmm. <laughs> so i'm just kind of like all right okay i see and like they have a kid and she's an architect and it's like dream life but and so hawkeye and winter soldier two of her exes are just like wait is she... okay we finally f we found her now we know she's off the grid but it doesn't feel like it's intentional so is she in danger like do we right. need to pull her out it feels are we like just she's living too her jealous. best life are we just two jealous guys that can't believe that our ex found happiness without us right, <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah like literally so that's kind of the vibe so just kind of seeing why it is she's being brainwashed like who's behind it what their motivations are mm -hmm. was so fascinating but it's it gets real dark real quick like the last like kind of story beats of this first collection really shocked me because I was like, mm. they did, they did not just do that. They did. And then they didn't, or did they? It's a lot of like twists and turns. And um, I, it was a really nice read because I have not read a lot of black widow comics, but I have, you know, been seeing her in the Avengers movies mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and stuff for the last 10 years or however long it's been that they've been making those 12 years out of it. So uh, but it felt like a nice jumping on point for somebody who like only knows about her through the movie stuff because there were characters that I recognized like from the movies. I didn't feel like I needed to know the last hundred issues of Black Widow to know where this was going. Totally. I'm kind of curious to continue from this point, but I'm also like, no, that was a really solid story. I don't know where you go from here. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the the direction that series goes is is bonkers, but I feel like if you liked the first volume, you will like as the story continues. Like Kelly Thompson is an incredible writer. Like I trust her with my life at this point. Like anything she puts her <laughs> name on, I'm like, okay, yeah, whatever. This sounds weird. I'm I'm on board. All right, I'm game. I would say like the one thing that I really had to kind of focus on while reading this was the fight scenes. There are a few like intricate double page spread fight scenes where you're seeing like six different black widows going around the room because they're showing the progression of like how she's going through a room and beating everybody up and some of those were just like hard for me to follow like there's there was one early in the story where i got to the end of the fight sequence and i realized she was barefoot and i was like hold up when did she lose her shoes and i had to like <laughs> go back and be like at what point <laughs> did she take off her boots and does this make sense and it's like no it feels like her boots just fell off at one point or maybe she like stuck a stiletto into somebody's neck and like mm. but like even if you did that there's not enough force holding that shoe in that dude's neck so it like pulls off your foot so i i, I couldn't explain it to you if i tried <laughs> but uh yeah did like do recommend probably will continue okay yeah, yeah. well now i i've got a question which is um now you like you said it came out um in the pandemic era mm -hmm. and uh it came out uh, in single issues what do you think the experience would have been like to actually have been reading it at the time as single issues as they came in oh great question i love comics time travel um <laughs> it's <laughs> no it is a different experience if you read month to month versus everything in one go 
Um, I think reading it month to month, especially if I was getting it, I assume like on digital or if your comic shop was doing delivery or pickup or something like that, it just would have added to the surrealness of the situation. Like, you know, something's wrong, like something doesn't feel right for her and it didn't feel right for you. So it probably would have been a more visceral experience going along with her journey. Yeah, I, I was reading this when it was coming out month to month, right at the time. And I was at this point, like all of my Marvel pulls were digital. Sure. I feel like I feel like it was nice to escape into a world of mystery where I could understand the mystery and what was happening. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> you, you know, like the the what's safe, what's not like, let's let these dumb boys try to figure out what's happening with their their ex-girlfriend um, mm-hmm. was a nice, fun little story to read. Um on top of the world that was i you know couldn't leave my 600 square foot apartment so um yeah well if if you don't mind me getting philosophical on top of that Mm -hmm. um they say that that's actually the reason why people like to make up uh stories about how the world works uh that aren't true because fiction always makes more sense than reality because fiction is designed to make sense whereas reality is not right i absolutely understand that completely (laughs) That must be why I like reading stories and watching stories so much. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, what yeah. do you do? I consume media. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> well, I'm, Kara, I'm glad that you got to you get to finally tackle this series because I, I have a feeling that I was one of the champions, but I know that I was one was of many <laughs> who were who were screaming about this book because it's, it's very very fun. Um, mm-hmm. So I'm glad that you enjoyed it. But uh, let me let me talk about a book that I've been reading uh, when I'm not dealing with problems of my home my hundred year old home falling apart um i have read a handful of comic books uh one of those books is uh batman universe this is written by brian michael bendis pencils and inks by nick darrington colors by dave stewart and letters by josh reed danny recommended this to me um on his panelist episode when we asked the final question of hey now that you know us for so long what comic book would you recommend to us? Um, this That question is going to get harder and harder and harder as we do more and more panelist episodes because how the hell is Paul going to recommend me a comic when we eventually get to that point? But we'll we'll see what happens when we get there. Maybe Paul will pull a rabbit out of a hat or something. Um, but anyways, this was a, a, a really, really fun read. It's Brian Michael Bendis, so there, it's very wordy. But you know what? Batman talking to Alfred back and forth with a bunch of like jives and, and goofiness is actually really, really entertaining, I found. Um, so that's kind of the story. Batman is on a mission. He's trying to stop the Riddler from doing some awful thing that we don't really know what it is, but it's the Riddler doing the Riddler stuff. So there's clearly like a question and a big question mark. And suddenly there's a ton of different people dressed up as the Riddler and no one knows what's going on. But there's like a weird thing that happens kind of within the first issue where the Riddler is not as clever as Batman expects him to be. He's like, why? Why did you ask me this question? That's actually not clever at all. And the Riddler can't seem to get past it. It's like this weird thing. And so you you start to you think like there's a big heist going on the riddler's involved but there's some other element that's causing the entire game that batman is participating in with the riddler to change um now the story is called batman universe because this is not just a story about batman and and the riddler this is a story about the entire multiverse potentially collapsing because of this thing that's happening in the story and i cannot express what it is without spoiling the big thing that's at the center of the book but oh my gosh the way that brian michael bendis ramped this book up from just classic batman and the riddler stuff up to universe ending bullshit was like i felt like i was slowly being like I was being boiled like a frog, right? Like I, it was, it was very slow and then sudden, like it, I didn't see it coming until it was finally there. And I really liked it. That like the, the way that the entire twist happened, Nightwing gets involved, uh, universe spanning people from all walks of life in the dc universe get involved and the fact that this is all contained within six issues is massively impressive um i feel like as a person who's read a ton of brian michael bendis books um sometimes bendis needs eight to twelve issues to really like hit his mark and kind of get all the words out of his system um somehow in six issues he manages to do that and i was so impressed um nick darrington does an amazing job drawing all things DC universe. Like it starts as just a straightforward Batman book and then becomes so much more. And every single time a new element was introduced to the story, my jaw was dropping. Like Darrington knew how to drew knows how to draw every single DC thing that you know and love in the modern Batman world. And then some, and then the rest of the bat or the DC universe. So 
really really can't recommend this enough dave stewart nails it on colors i mean that's expected it's freaking dave stewart um but yeah this oh, this book ruled in a way that i was like I didn't think I was going to like it from the start. And then by the end, I was like, oh, this is big and dumb and exciting. That's that's <laughs> perfect for a six issue Batman series. So totally love this. Um, yeah, but I don't know. Have you guys heard of this? I, I wouldn't be surprised if you hadn't heard of this because it was originally one of those comics published only at Walmart stores. What? And then eventually DC recollected it into this single issue. So DC for a minute. If you remember, the, this was like a while ago, right? They they were okay. publishing a handful of stories. I think there was like a Batman story, a Green Lantern story, a Wonder Woman story, and a Superman story. They were all being published like in these weird collections over at Walmart, and you could only get them at Walmart. And then DC was like, no, 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 don't worry. We're going to eventually collect these, and you can buy them outside of a Walmart. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, this is like published in a thing called Batman were batman giant as like they did this with a few exclusive books it's very weird sure. but then they recollected it into this thing so i'm curious after this came out because it is available as like a collection or something um had you heard of this at all because i completely hadn't until danny told me about it i gotta say no and to dc <laughs> weird flex but okay yeah, and yeah. uh yeah i yeah i i uh, i i actually what did what do both of you think of, about this distribution model? Like, what do you think about like the the ethics and the business of it? Well, that's the thing. It was like they were publishing these like hundred page collection magazine things that were called like Batman Giant for. They did it for like a year and a half, from like twenty nineteen into twenty twenty, I think. Um, and or excuse me, twenty eighteen into twenty nineteen. I'm sorry, it was a. Okay. Uh, they did fourteen issues of Batman Giant. And then they did a Flash Giant, they did a Justice League Giant, Superman Giant, Swamp Thing Giant, Teen Titans Giant, Titans Giant, Wonder Woman Giant. Yeah, and I it was like they were exclusively publishing to Walmart because I think this was DC just saying like, we can get comics into people's hands by doing the old toy store model. Um, I don't know if it was successful. I think that's kind of the long and short of it. I have thoughts. Yeah. Um, my thoughts are this. Okay, cast your minds back in time okay. <laughs> picture it 2011 I, I have graduated from college i am getting i'm having a sweet sweet paid internship at archie comics and they hired me to cold call comic book stores around the country to tell them about upcoming archie comics Cool. And that is how I learned that there was no master list of comic book shops around America. <laughs> so there yeah. I am <laughs> in like 2011 Google, Googling comic book stores, creating my own Excel document of them, using Google Maps Street View to verify if it looks like a store actually exists where it <laughs> says it exists or not. Oh my gosh. So let me tell you, <laughs> as I'm pretty sure the landscape of comic book shops has not fund like fundamentally shifted in the last decade. I can say with authority that comic book stores tend to be in highly populated areas sure. because that's your greater uh, potential client audience. Mm -hmm. So if you're distributing instead to Walmart, where there is a Walmart regardless of population density. Well, I'm sure they have a threshold, but yeah. you're more likely to find a Walmart in a rural area than you are a comic book shop. Mm -hmm. So it is an interesting uh, experiment in, can we get a more like rural and suburban readership versus a more urban readership for comic books? And, I, you know, digital has kind of made this a moot point if you want to find a comic book you'll be able to find a comic book mm -hmm. but for like casual shoppers or like you're getting your groceries and you like pass a batman comic and think oh i've got a 12 year old at home i'll pick this up for them exactly like, did exactly that have an impact i don't know it's not like dc's gonna tell anybody anytime soon <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> well you know i i i always thought that there was a huge untapped market and i i guess you know go ahead if you're in the business take this from me um there's a huge untapped market in getting um uh, uh, uh schools of different levels different age levels to get subscriptions to comic books mm. for you know grade school children get grade school appropriate comics like archie 
for for teenagers you can get the more you know dark and serious stuff and and, and even you know in high school you can even get the you know persepolis and you know they're like the really serious graphic novels and mm-hmm. and i feel like it's it's that thing that that apple did is when apple was first coming into business one of the first things they did was donate a bunch of computers to a bunch of schools mm-hmm. so that when they the kids grew up the computer they knew how to use was an apple yeah and it's just it's the same idea they should be t- they should be if they want to get to kids where are kids reading they're not reading in the house they're reading at school right so put it in front of them in school that's just what i'm thinking well th- and this is the thing is it, is it's so it's so funny that you say that because i feel like more and more libraries are getting comic books um and it's not superhero books right it's it's graphic novels it's harper collins it's it's scholastic you know they're in their imprints of, of original graphic novels um but then you run into the issue that we're seeing across the the nation of people trying to challenge these school purchases of books that are seemingly harmless, but they are informative in the same way that many prose books are just because they end up on some weird list on the internet that people are like, Oh, mom's against whatever decided that they don't like gender queer, right? Uh, A book that is in my mind, not even remotely explicit. And yet people say, Oh, it's, it's pornography for children, right? It's like, it's this very frustrating thing, but I think that we don't necessarily have to talk about the controversy there. That is absolute bullshit, but like, we can talk about the fact that these libraries are already buying these books, I think is a very good sign. But I think, uh, yeah. Bijan, what you're getting at is like trying to find a way to put these into the curriculum so that kids are reading comics as part of like their understanding of, of literature and fiction on top of just reading prose books. Right. Or maybe. That's, Absolutely. Because, yeah. you know, like, for example, um, Charles Moulton's run, Charles Moulton's run on um, Wonder Woman and the art of Harry G. Peter are things that should be studied in an elementary school classroom as fundamental parts of American culture. If you Mm. want to know what America was like in the 1940s, you can't do that without studying the comics that were influential at the time. So keeping them out of history classrooms, keeping them out of English language classrooms, keeping them out of art classrooms is a form of cultural elitism. Mm. And we should be lobbying for comic books to be part of our, our understanding of who we are as a people, both as human beings and as Americans. I mean, I love that because Absolutely. I had that experience growing up again, reading Archie comics. And like, I wasn't reading just the new stuff. I was reading like the double digest collections at the checkout counter that included stories from the fifties, the sixties, the seventies, or like mm-hmm. reading the old issues that my grandmother still had from when my mom was a kid from mm-hmm. like the sixties and seventies. And so I got a more like contemporaneous version of different decades in American life through that lens. And I wasn't like thinking about it like that as a kid, I was just like, Ooh, they're wearing bell bottoms in this one. But you know, (laughs) over time I was like, Oh, I have like different, like more nuanced cultural references because I'm reading these comic books and they're like referencing a fake Elvis or like a fake Madonna and you know, those kinds of things. Yeah. And, and, and a great example of, of, how far we've come and how digital comics have changed this. Um, I think that you could have it so that classrooms are set up so that they are, uh, they all, a lot of them already have computers in the classroom. A lot of them already have laptops for individual children. Mm -hmm. And uh, it would cost nothing to send out a PDF of a new DC comic from the archives or not new, a a DC comic from the archives new to the curriculum Mm -hmm. each month that uh, children could understand um, what's going on in the, the history of the world at that point. Why did people want literature like this? How did the culture affect our understanding of these events and the morality of the stories? There's so much that we can understand because they are such important reflections of, of our reality and expressions of artistic creation from people who lived in that world. So, um, yeah, again, you know, they need belong in, in almost every classroom except science and math. <laughs> yeah. Let me call the every social studies teacher in the world and be like, you know what, as part of your fun Fridays, bring a comic <laughs> book of the decade that you're studying in school, you know, like in modern Absolutely. American history, right? Yeah, that's great. I love that idea. I'm, I'm going to we're going to clip that and we're going to send it to, to every school district in America and say, <laughs> like, this this needs to happen. Um, but <laughs> before we dive any deeper onto that, I do think that there's like more to be talked about around the Walmart distribution thing. Um, Nick found a really interesting article from uh, the comics from Comics Beat. I'll probably put in the show notes about like DC's response to like 
working with Walmart and stuff. It seems like it was very positive for them. But um, then again, you're not going to be mad at the biggest freaking one of the biggest companies in the world. So I don't know. Um, but let's talk about comic books that are on the top of a pile. Let's talk about books that are new or old or just something you're trying to get off of your shelf. I want to shout out some of the folks that are hanging out with us live as we're recording today on Sundays at 1 p.m. That's when we do the show. Uh, you too could be on the Discord listening live right now. Um, they've got some books on the top of their pile, particularly Paul G has one book on the top of his pile, which is Planets. Uh, I believe this is a comic, the manga series that came before the current Vinland saga. It's done by the same creator. So if you like Vinland saga, you'll probably like planets assuming Paul, that's the right book. Um, but I'm just gonna, I can't see your response yet. So, um, yeah, very exciting. I, I'm also mean to read this book because I love Vinland Saga and it's beautiful. Um, so one day, one day I'll get to that huge manga series. Maybe after I finish Naruto, maybe after I finish every other series that I'm currently reading. But uh, Kara, <laughs> let's let's bounce over to you. What is on the top of your pile this week? I just want to say that I am very proud of myself for trying superhero comics again because <laughs> I know I love them, but uh -huh. I've been having... I don't know. I just I feel like the last year or so, maybe longer, I haven't been actively seeking out superhero comics. I've been actively seeking out more like one and done like fantasy stories or just like or slice of life, just like anything but the big two. And I feel like I've been kind of tiptoeing back to the big two and appreciating those stories. Mm -hmm. So I feel like this is a, a banner week on the show because I read a superhero comic and I will read a different superhero comic. Wow, let's <laughs> I give, know. give Kara round of applause, everybody. <laughs> so where I read a Marvel comic, I will read a DC comic. I will be reading Nightwing Volume 1, Leaping into the Light, oh. uh, creative team Tom Taylor and Bruno Redondo. And by the sound that Mike just made, I'm pretty sure... <laughs> This is a good choice. I, I've only heard like explicit positive things about this. Like it's it's very good from what I understand. Tom Taylor kind of doesn't mess around when he gets on runs. Mm -hmm. So I think you're going to be very happy. I mean, I just I, I really love bat adjacent books. I've never yeah. really liked reading Batman comics. But if you give me like a Huntress comic or the question or the Birds of Prey mm -hmm. or like Oh man, Red Robin, vintage, oh, chef's kiss. Like <laughs> mm -hmm. any of the, those things, I'm all in. But I've never really gotten into the Nightwing comics. And I think it's because, like, Dick Grayson is fine. He's fine. He's not the best Robin. That's Tim Drake. But, like, so when he's like, okay, now he's Nightwing, I just, I never really got in into that. And I got used to him showing up in terms of being like a bad boyfriend to one of like the girls in like the girl focused books I was reading. <laughs> <laughs> and so, I was like, Dick Grayson, fuck boy with a great ass. Okay. <laughs> so, so you've already described all of the covers of Nightwing volume one. Because I think if you do a quick Google search, <laughs> all, the, all the Nick Darrington covers are very horny. <laughs> Great. I mean, I impulse bought a Nightwing comic at the comic shop like two months ago because it was just like him as a sexy pirate, like on sure. a pirate ship. And I was like, I don't even I know I'm buying this for the cover. I know I'm that person right Amazing. now. That's fine. Amazing. Anyways. So, yeah, that's, <laughs> just... you know, my uh, my partner um, doesn't have like a long history with comics. So mm -hmm. I'm introducing him to comic book media. And one of the things we're doing is watching through uh, the DC animated universe. And so we just got finished with uh, the Batman series. Mm -hmm. And as soon as Dick went from being Robin to Nightwing mm -hmm. and we got, uh, I think it was, a, yeah, we got a younger Robin. I don't remember which one they picked for that. Tim. But as soon as Dick went from, from being Robin to Nightwing, my partner was like, yep, nope, that's the one. No, mm -hmm. keep it that way. Well, that's he had that hot 90s mullet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> so I said Nick Darrington earlier. I meant Bruno Redondo. Totally different creator. Anyways, sorry, sorry. It's all good. No, so I will be, I will be trying that. Uh, maybe I'll eventually get up to the point where I can read the sexy pirate covered comic or <laughs> maybe I'll stop. I don't know. But uh, I'm trying a new old thing and we will see how it goes. I'm, I'm very excited for you because, again, I've only heard Thank good you. things. And Tom Taylor does a good job sometimes with characters that he cares a lot about. Like he did his his all new Wolverine series with and he basically gave Laura Kinney the perfect story ever. Um, so I trust him 
for pretty much anything. I haven't read everything that he's done, but I'm always up for a Tom Taylor book because mm -hmm, he did write mm -hmm. by my girl and that's all I care about. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, let me let me talk about a book that I'm reading next uh, because I <laughs> made a mistake in, in the past, um, past Mike decided that future Mike needed to have even more comic books. So there was this Kickstarter for uh, a series called or a story called Safer Places by Kit Air Anderson. Um, and it's a book about personal inflection or personal uh, in introspection and all this other stuff. But as part of that, uh, the publisher who put on this this Kickstarter was also like, hey, here's a bunch of other books that we have if you want to add them on. And past Mike was like, well, <laughs> what's a couple more books? Uh -huh. um, and so I ended up with like three Tilly Walden books and like two other books. So today uh, I'm going to talk about a book that I want to read next, which is A City Inside. This is by Tilly Walden. It's a story uh, that's uh, shifting between the everyday and the surreal. A City Inside recounts one woman's life from childhood home to the first love that she will never forget to the creation of the idea of herself that she can grow old and with with and the home that she can grow old in. Sorry, weird sentence. Walden's follow up to the lyrical I love this part, which I also got as part of this Kickstarter bundle um, is a poetic exploration of the process of growing older, the journey towards finding who you are and building a life for yourself, which I'm excited to read because Tilly Walden is just amazing. Um, this is a nice thin book compared to some of the other books that I own by Tilly Walden, like on a sunbeam, which is massive, but also a pleasure to read from start to finish. Um, but yeah, I, as expected though, this book looks gorgeous. Just paging through it. You can look at some of the preview pages um, on Avery Hill publishing's website. Um, this is all in black and white, but it's pure black and white. There's no grays. Unlike Walden's recent work on something like Clementine, which is like walking dead style, black whites and grays because it's, in the walking dead universe um but yeah this book looks pretty wild in terms of like there is this reality shifting with like dreamscapes all in one thing and one of the things that i was thinking about um just in general regarding tilly's work is that i, I love what she did with on a sunbeam so much and that it blends like sci-fi with like magical realism all in one 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 shape like by you know people taking these giant fish and flying throughout the universe to go mine on these dead planets and meteors like there's something so just like sad and yet very exciting at the same time um about that series and i'm really excited to see what walden does with her art for a book that has what feels like kind of a darker like thought behind it you know about the idea of love and can you grow old and be happy like I'm very excited to see what she does with that, but I'm also bracing myself for what will probably be like a very rough impact when I finally finish it. Um, but nonetheless, it looks it looks very beautiful um, and it's not massive. So I'll probably fly through this and the other. I love this part um, book just because I have both of them sitting side by side on this pile, literal pile of comics that I got in the mail the other day. Um, I'm so mad at past Mike for thinking that I needed five more graphic novels in my house. <laughs> uh, but that's that's what I'm reading next. Um, Bijan, what about you? What is on the top of your pile? I guess to wrap up the show pretty much. So, uh, I have a long and storied history with the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles and IDW has just wrapped up their run on the, the rebooted comic book series yeah. with Kevin Eastman at the helm. Um, and so I had, I own, uh, physically a, a physical copy of volume one. I've read it many times, nice. but I've never gotten past volume one. So, um, so it's, uh, I had to go, uh, into the comic book and look at the very long list. Um, there's actually a whole lot of artists and, uh, writers that contributed to this volume because it includes comics, uh, in single issues that weren't actually in the official numbering of the TMNT. Right. They were considered uh, single one-offs or, uh, spin-offs, uh, miniseries or things like that. So the main writers are Tom Waltz and Kevin Eastman. Um, then, then, uh, Brian Lynch was the predominant writer on most of the spinoffs, although there were a few others, Dan Duncan did, um, the art for the mainline series, but there was a different artist for every single, um, and other like spinoff and miniseries, the thing that they did, it's one off. Um, it is such a treat to see something from my childhood treated with so much respect. Yeah. Um, Aww. and you know, I, of course, as a kid who grew up, you know, I was born in 89. So the Ninja Turtles was at the height of its popularity when I was born. Right. And um, I inherited VHS tapes from my cousins of seasons one and two of the, the animated series. So I grew up with 
um, a strong concept of the Ninja Turtles. And I, of course, loved them. I had pajamas, you know, great. But, but they didn't really change my life until I was a teenager and I went and sought out the original 84 series. <laughs> and the, the TMNT that I grew up with as a kid was really, I, it was nice. It was good. It was positive. But it didn't have a lot of depth. And it, there wasn't a lot to it. Um, and the 84 series is basically like it starts off with the, the first issue being a straight up parody of comics at the time. The idea of, of mutants and ninjas and being dark and gritty was sort of a parody of where Daredevil was going at the time, right. especially. Um, I mean, the hand, so the first the issue <laughs> is, yeah, the first issue is really different. I mean, that's why it's the foot and the hand. Yeah. Um, but the, the first issue is really different from the rest of the actual series. Totally. Because with the first issue, they were just doing a one-off parody. Then they realized that they had something there, and they started mining down into its potential. And right about, at, I think it's about volume two, is they call it the, the City at War arc, is when they really tuned into who the characters were. They had, they had done some crossovers with other indie comics at the time. You know, they had done some fun one-off series and, and or one-off bits, I mean, uh, uh, on different issues, really, uh, in, in, you know, not very uh, consistently. Uh, but then the, in, in the City at War arc, then they really started putting out an issue a year or an issue a, a month. Mm -hmm. um, they really started tuning into who these characters are, what they're about, and they really got into this idea that the turtles are turtles. They are not human beings and the things they want and need out of life are not necessarily the things that a human being would want or need out of life mm. they have functionally no gender expression the calling them he is almost trivia uh they they don't have much any kind of machismo they don't have any kind of effeminate but they also don't have any really very masculine uh, features or attributes and Except for at the very end of the series when there's like a little bit of romance with an alien, hmm. there is functionally no romance or sexuality in the series, like at all, mm -hmm. um, except between human characters, you know, like two, two human characters. Mutants aren't perceived as being functionally asexual, again, except for one small thing towards the end of the series. Hmm. Um, but uh, but so this this the 84 series had a very profound effect on the way I thought about how personhood is not necessarily the same thing as humanity and that a, 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 some, a, a person can be a person without being a human being and that what makes us human can be very different than what makes us a person. Hmm. Um, and so then going and then I, I grew up more, I became an adult and this IDW series started. And because Kevin Eastman was back on board, I was much more hopeful than for any of the other projects that had happened before. Sure, yeah. It's a comic book, which means they're counting on the fact they're, they, they know it's not going to make as much money as a TV animated series sure. or a, a live action movie. So that means that they have fewer chips on the table, which means that they're allowing the creator to have stronger, uh, a stronger uh, hand in the process so that they can double down on the audience they do know they have. And so um, when I was reading this, this volume one, and the reason why my version is now worn out is because it completely captures the spirit of that original 84 series, but with a much more refined master's hand at actual storytelling. Totally. Because Kevin Eastman is just that many more years of experience in writing comics. Mm -hmm. So, and, and one of the things that I love about it is that each issue delivers a little bit of action, a little bit of drama, and a little bit of lore. And then the issue ends. And then the next issue, they have a little bit of drama, a little bit of action, a little bit of lore. So yeah. it, each each issue, it keeps you it keeps you pumped up. It keeps you going. It keeps you moving from just flowing from page to page. So um, now that the whole thing's over, and I know it's ups and downs, generally from cultural osmosis, and I know what to expect out of the series and that it ends on such a high note, um, I'm very excited to push past uh, volume one and start reading the rest. I've been yeah, meaning I... to try this series for years now, but it mm -hmm. like like Mike referenced the Eternal Pile earlier. Like yeah. that's on the Eternal TBR, <laughs> but yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, you make a compelling case. Thank you. 
<laughs> yeah, I've, I've read that first volume um, twice, I think, and I, I do love the rhythm of the series, right? Like the the old 84 comics have their own their own style and feel and whatever, right? It's it's very bonkers in, in some ways, but I feel like this this series, as you said, it really refines all of that and like creates a very good just like beat that you can follow. And so getting through that first volume is such a breeze. Um, I have to imagine the rest of the series, even though I know it goes some different places with a lot of the miniseries and whatever, but I have to imagine the core series has that same vibe throughout, um, especially because I think Eastman was on it for a lot of it, if I'm if if not if I'm not mistaken. But um, yeah, no, this I I am also very excited to see the end of this current run um, because now it means that there's like a big like understandable amount of TMNT that I could sit down and potentially try to tackle. So um, mm-hmm. yeah. But I guess before we we really, really wrap up the show, um, I guess, Bijan, do you want to tell us a little bit about the Kickstarter that you have running right now um, and what people can do to potentially support? Yeah, absolutely. So um, uh, it's been about a year since I was on talking about Cobra Olympus. So uh, a lot of people probably don't remember or are new. So uh, Cobra Olympus, my idea was to create a superhero like me. You know, they say that we want representation. And they say, and they keep saying, "Oh, don't change our existing characters." Well, fine, then I'll make my own. Mm-hmm. You know, and uh, it's as as Bender would say, "I'm going to go make my own comic book, and it's going to have blackjack and hookers." <laughs> uh, <laughs> wait, wait, hold on. Did I misread Cobra Olympus number one? That, <laughs> what did I miss that part? <laughs> no, no. <laughs> uh, but it's going to be as cool as if it did. Okay. okay. Uh, <laughs> No. So, uh, so no, but the idea is, is that I, I, I did spend some time trying to work inside the system, trying to get things created in, in the existing system with the existing companies that, that ha- happened and they didn't, they didn't respond. So, you know, I just stormed off and made my own. And the idea that I wanted to have was my love for classic comics. I think that I've made that clear. I've, I have a, a very deep love for the history of comics. Totally. And, um, and especially, I really love Golden Age, World War II era comics because they're so overtly political mm-hmm. in their anti-fascism. And they're, uh, they're wanting to change the world. They knew that they were in a moment in time where history could flow two, one of two very different ways. And those authors were not sitting on the sideline. They were creating propaganda to try and create a better world than the alternative. And so I felt like we're at another juncture in our history as a human species. And we need, again, people standing up from the sidelines and cheering and creating propaganda for the right side of history. Hmm. So, um, you know, I mean, even even just saying things like don't drink and drive, buckle your seatbelt, brush your teeth, that's propaganda. Sure. So I'm trying to make propaganda saying be a nice person. Be good to other people. Have unity between groups of people. Uh, liberate people who are being oppressed. So, um, and I wanted to do that in the style of a 1940s comic. And I, I thought, what a great way to do it is to also inspi- be inspired by the visuals, too. So, Cobra Olympus is, in, is the story is, is she is a, a trans and Muslim superhero who is trying to just live a normal life as a Seattle web designer when she starts getting messages from the future. And these messages from the future guide her to use her skills and abilities to start defeating monsters. And as she's defeating these monsters, she's changing the outcome of history. And so she's become a soldier in the time wars. And we're doing this in 20 page issues with brisk compressed storytelling. I've really studied, I've really studied compressed storytelling and I feel like I've got a really strong handle on it in a way that they hadn't completely mastered when some of the the most influential comic books were coming out. Sure. Um yeah, cuz cuz I I I've had so much um uh ability to to look back on what worked and didn't work over, you know, almost coming up on a century mm-hmm. um you know i'm standing on the shoulders of giants other people have done all this work to try out new things and i have the benefit of hindsight of being able to look back on what what worked and what didn't so we're doing compressed storytelling and the art is uh bold black lines and the uh, and bold uh block colors and we're trying to create something that's really vibrant and really action-packed and really fun 
but at the same time containing a very serious message about how we can create a future that's better for everyone, every single person on earth. And, um, and, you know, one of the things that, in, that inspired me to make it this way was I had a, a very interesting experience as a kid. Uh, I had re read a lot of these classic 1940s comics in the, uh, the library and, you know, I loved them. And then one day uh, we were taking a, a trip to another town uh, in the same state and at the gas station, they were selling individual issues of comics. And I begged my mom for a Spider-Man comic and I read it. And the concept was Spider-Man and Green Goblin were stuck in an elevator crash, but neither one of them could leave the elevator crash, even though they physically could. But they couldn't do it because they were in their civilian identities. And so they spent the whole time talking about how the first person to move would reveal themselves. And I have to say, as an adult, I appreciate the concept. But as a kid, I was very disappointed <laughs> that, I had, that I had just gotten a Spider-Man comic and he's never in costume mm. and he never fights anyone. So that was <laughs> so that was something that I wanted to address in the series. I wanted every issue to feel like if that's the only Cobra Olympus comic you ever read, you understand who Cobra Olympus is. Gotcha. And yeah, I wanted to show her character, her flaws, her virtues, her shortcomings, her abilities. I wanted to show everything in every issue. And I wanted to do it in 20 pages. So ambitious. Um, that's ambitious. Yeah. Well, I, I, I feel like, you know, I feel like I'm not biting off more than I can chew sure. because I've been a creative for so long and I've spent so long studying how other people have succeeded or failed at this that I feel like I've done the equivalent of a, of a master's course hmm. on, on creating comics. Um, and, uh, you know, a lot of the comics I've created in the past I've shown to many people, but have not become publicly available. Mm. So this is my first like big public effort, but it's not my first effort. Gotcha. gotcha. Uh, and uh, and yeah, so this this issue number two uh, that we're coming out with because we did this last year and now we're doing an issue number two. It's um, it's really important to me because we've made the the next character that Cobra teams up with a Jewish non-binary person. It's a boxer named Etta Kitchell. And uh, she's a wonderful reference to uh, Wonder Woman. Uh, Wonder Woman originally had a, a big lady who was her sidekick named Etta Candy. Mm. And she would always beat up Nazis and, and she would ride her jalopy into battle. And, uh, and so I wanted to create a character that was inspired by that. But I specifically wanted to make them Jewish because my partner's Jewish and I'm Muslim. And we spend a lot of time worrying about what's happening all over the world to both of our people. And um, we believe strongly that there needs to be a future where Jewish people and Muslim people can live in peace and harmony and work together to create a future where we all uh, have access to everything we need and where no one is subjected to hate of any kind hmm. and where violence is, an, is a non-issue in the relationship between these two people. And so that's the future that we want to make. That's the future that we want to create. And that's the future that we have to preach in the stories that we make. So the story is a good old fashioned science fiction romp. A vampire from the future has, uh, re has animated a group of robots uh, on a college campus. Okay. And it's up to, <clears throat> and it's up to Cobra Olympus and Etta Kitchell to save the day. So the idea is if we want to advocate for, unity we have to show what unity looks like and that means teaming up to bring down the people who are actually threatening us yeah. and and so so it's a metaphor and at the same time it's a fun fantasy there's lots of action there's lots of adventure and there's a bunch of other side characters who each get their own moment to shine and uh the at the very end it's a very sweet sweet ending that shows how much how much better we all are by sharing a diverse range of experiences with each other and by all being so different from each other. So, uh, so that's, that's what we were planning on doing for, for issue number two. And that's, that's, what's going to be on the Kickstarter. And so we have a digital edition, which is available for $2. That's the both um, issue number one and issue number two. We also have uh, physical singles, and we have uh, them even up to uh, we have a, a retailer tier 
and um, that uh, brings the unit price down to the point where um, it's a, a great thing that you can stock in your store. Um, awesome. And it's, yeah, it's so uh, but but uh, but everything is limited. Mm-hmm. So we are printing a very limited number of copies. So this first edition of the issue number two will have a gold border on the front, and that will indicate that it is a first edition, and it will will never use that gold border on issue number two ever again. And so that will make it uh, a collector's edition for sure, recognizable on the spot. And then issue number one, we're doing a recolor of. Um, so uh, we were really interested in the idea of blending eras, so since the art and the storytelling is inspired by the golden age, but we have modern computers, which can do much more complex things. Mm. We wanted to give people who had already bought issue number one last time, a reason to see the story in a new light. And we wanted to give people who were now coming on board with the story, a way to read issue number one without us. Again, we, we, the, the, with a gold border, uh, uh, first edition, you know, that's out of print. You can't get that anymore. So these are definitely collector's editions. Gotcha. Um, so the issue number one recolor was a great way for us to have new people coming on board to have access to issue number one, but to have something cool and fun for people who had already, uh, who had already uh, supported us in the past. Um, and uh, we also have some fun add-ons. We have a vinyl sticker pack uh, with uh, images from the comic. Um, and they're they're actually strong enough that you can be used as bumper stickers, but they're also great on laptops and nice. lockers and things like that. We got a poster, and um, we even have uh, uh, pages from my original notebook where I drew the sketches that would become the comic. Oh, that that's sounds really cool. Very well <laughs> thought out. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> top to bottom. Uh, if I may ask, what were your personal takes on the the comic? How did you react personally? Kara, you just read it. I, I haven't read it in a minute, but go go ahead. I just I just want to triple check that we're talking about Time Wars, the yes. adventures yes. of Cobra Olympus. Yes. Okay, Time so, Wars, the adventures of Cobra Olympus. Yes. So I, so I read issue one, mm-hmm. and I like you said, like the pacing was really kind of more like that Golden Age or Silver Age, more like it's snappy. You've got your setup, your action. What I really liked about it was um, kind of you're not just getting that action, although the action was fun, and I clocked that Indiana Jones reference. I liked that. <laughs> but, uh, but um, you know, there's also uh, you're getting to see who Cobra Olympus is secret identity-wise as well as hero-wise, and the secret identity-wise subplot of like, going on a first date with someone I thought was really well done with like the dialogue and the internal monologue of being like nervous and trying to feel somebody out and be like, am I comfortable? Are they comfortable? Is this the vibe that I'm looking for? And um, trying to like, like being in that space of uncertainty where you don't really know if the other person is on your level and like how that resolves. Um, I thought that was, like an unexpectedly like powerful personal moment to include in something that also involves r- vampires <laughs> from the future. <laughs> yeah. You know, I, I always felt like that was, I feel like there's, there's something that is um, not the best about a lot of moves in, in modern comics is that there's an attempt to try and make them more cinematic. And I don't feel like that's the best move because it's not cinema and you can't be better at cinema than cinema sure. so i've always felt like the narrative bubble the narrative box and the thought bubble were really powerful methods of conveying something that you can't do in literature and you can't do in cinema in literature you can't see the person's face you only have descriptions of their thoughts and in cinema you can only see their face but you don't have any descriptions of their thoughts sure. whereas in a comic it's not moving and it's not as detailed as a as a novel would be but you can see their face and you can hear their thoughts, and you can hear what they're saying. That's so that's such a, a unique perspective on a story with storytelling that I feel like not including those elements is almost you know 
fighting with one hand behind your back. <laughs> right. Right. The the fact that you used thought bubbles throughout this this issue or the first issue was was very fun to me because it did feel very like classic style because I feel like <laughs> n- nowadays most comics do not use thought bubbles. I think we we did like an entire episode talking about that about how rare it is for us to see thought bubbles in comics whereas like in these golden age, you know, silver age comics they were all over the place, right? Um you'd get someone thinking about an action they were about to do minute like two panels before in a thought bubble. Um so uh, I, I I like that you use that you know throughout the, the issue because it did add that kind of like I hate to say it but it's almost like a cheesy feeling to like the the entire <laughs> vibe of things but like in a good cheese way cheese is delicious yeah exactly <laughs> cheese is delicious uh, and I think it it it, 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 it I don't know what I'm trying to say it puts you in like a specific mindset about how you're going to be reading the rest of the book when you as soon as you start to see that you kind of get that there's like a a different vibe to the book there isn't like this super gritty like this person is so clever 24 seven, we can't know anything they're thinking, because they're just going to act and we don't know what's coming next. It's like, no, there is like a fun t- to that when you have like the thought bubble in someone, you know, on the page, and you know what they're thinking in the moment when they're acting or acting on things, especially mm-hmm. when what they're thinking is opposite of maybe what they want to be doing. But here they are stuck in a situation, you know. Um, so I, I did enjoy that quite a bit about the first issue. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, I thought really hard, long and hard about that. Yeah. I, I really wanted to include uh, thought bubble is a narrative text because I felt like it was a great way to convey emotion in a way that is unique to comics because I just I just love the medium of comics and so mm. I want to be as 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 you know instead of cinematic I want to be com- comic etic I don't know if that's yeah, yeah. What I, I want to be as, <laughs> as as I want to double down as much on the comic format as possible definitely mm-hmm. um well, you know, I, I think that is that is a great a great place for us to wrap up this show today. Um, I mean, uh, Bijan, this is this has been a fantastic conversation. Just one more time for the folks at home. What's the name of the book and, and where can they find it? I guess your, your what's the name of your studio, all that stuff. Where can people find you on the Internet? Sure. So it's Time Wars, the Adventures of Cobra Olympus. And uh, we, we never pointed this out. Cobra is spelled with a K. Mm. So all this time you probably thought it was a C. It's Cobra with a K, Cobra Olympus, like the mountain. Uh, you can search for it on Kickstarter. Um, there's uh, 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 there. It, if you, you go to search, you just type in Cobra with a K and then Olympus. I guarantee there's nothing else on yeah, there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and we'll have a link in the show notes uh, too. <laughs> um, and then we also have a studio that's producing at Jamsheed Studios. We have Patreon, Patreon.com/slash Jamsheed Studios. Jamsheed is spelled J A M J A M S H E E D. Yeah, it's a tongue twister even for me. <laughs> um, but uh, Jamshid was the legendary founder of Iran, so I thought being an Iranian American, it'd be cool to name a studio after him. Um, so the idea with the studio is that we, when we take in patron money, we use it on physical and digital resources to help our artists and creators keep going, mm. so that when the products are released, it can be creator owned. So that's in total contradiction to the existing um, studio model where the sure. studio owns everything and they pay a day rate. So instead, the studio buys things like tablets and uh, subscriptions to Photoshop and things like that so that we can actually make the comics and the video games and the music that we're already making. And uh, and when it comes out, the people who made it are going to be the people who own it. So if anyone wants to support that, uh, it's $1 to get a newsletter every month and ten dollars to get behind the scene goodies like first looks at sketches and uh, interviews with different artists. So, um, and then we have higher tiers than that. But uh, but yeah, the, the, those are the two big ones: one dollar for the newsletter, ten dollars for the the producer support. Very cool. Very cool. Yeah, we'll nice. we'll make sure to put all those links in the show notes. But uh, go ahead, Kara. Oh no, no, no! I was just saying, nice, lovely. Thank you for sharing. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Very uh, well, thorough. The theme continues. <laughs> yes, yeah. Very much appreciate the the thoroughness here. Uh, but I, again, I think that wraps us up for this week. Um, this has been an absolute blast to talk about uh, comics and everything else that you've got going on, uh, Bijan. This is very, very fun. Um, next week's show is a pre-recorded episode, if I'm not mistaken. So there won't be anything live on Discord. But after that, um, I'm not going to be here. So um, Godspeed to you, folks. I hope. The show comes out. Um, 
<laughs> we don't need you, Mike. Yeah, I We're know. fine. Here's the thing. I don't think anybody actually needs me on the show at this point. But um, yeah, so I want to say thank you again to Kara for this episode. Thank you, Bijan, for reaching out and coming out and talking comics with us. And this, is, this has been a blast as always. And wish you the best of luck on the Kickstarter. Uh, thank you to Paul for listening live. Thank you to Nick for proof, proof listening. Thank you to Xander for being Xander. And until next time, comics are good. And so are you. Thank you.